Hello and welcome. Today we're here at M&M in Portland 2022, live and in person again, and we're delighted to be here with our friends and collaborators from Nano Imaging Services, the gold standard in um, cryo-EM imaging services for the biotech industry. And we're here today to talk about something that's close to all of our hearts, uh, improving cryo-EM workflow efficiency and, and quality, especially in the area of sample preparation. So before we get started, I'd just like to introduce you to everybody here. We have Giovanna Scappi, who is Chief Scientific Officer at NIS, uh, and before that had a distinguished career at Merck, Structural Bio Drug Discovery, Structural Biology. And we have Matt Gipp, who is here. He's the Principal Scientist at Nano Imaging Services and works extensively with sample preparation with workflows. And then from SPT Avantex Community, we have Tim Booth, who is the Business Development Manager, but prior to that was a Facility Manager at UCSD, and Uliana Pavona, Panova, Uliana Panova, <laughs> our Apps and Developments person prior to, from previously worked uh, in the cryo in facility at Stanford. So Giovanna, I'd like to start with you. I know you see an unparalleled array of different samples coming in through the door at uh, NIS and that you're unusual in keeping a thorough record of all the different things, uh, that, all the different characterizations of the samples essentially. Um, I believe that you've noticed that most of them have some kind of issue. I wonder if you wouldn't mind commenting on some aspects of that and what kinds of issues you see. Sure. So, yes, we, we are in the unique position of having a really large number of samples coming to the door. And now we are also in a unique position of keeping track of all these samples and analyzing and actually seeing how they behave throughout their entire life uh, within our facilities from the moment they come to the door to the moment, if ever they end up on a grid, then they produce a three dimensional structure. And we have been doing single particle analysis seriously, single particle analysis for about two and a half years. And what we noticed is that of all the samples we have uh, uh, incoming, uh, the large, a very small minority of the samples are actually good samples that can go straight onto a grid and then on to a CRIOS for a, a structural determination. About less than 8% on average, these samples are good. The remaining 92% are characterized by a series of problems that are related to the sample itself or might be related to sample preparation, the way we, the way we used to for petrification of the sample. And that goes from size of the sample is too big to small, flexibility, um, falling apart. Very often we have complexes that are not very stable at the petrification condition that we use. And so we end up with something not, not usable. One very common problem that we observe is preferred orientation. So even a sample that looks perfectly fine under any biochemical characterization, once it crosses our door, very often fails, at least at the first, in the first start. Okay. So uh, I'm kind of interested to see, from all of you, uh, which one of those issues do you think is most serious and the most difficult to overcome? I mean, is it sample concentration? Is it flexibility? Is it heterogeneity? I would say the... The most difficult thing to overcome is when is it not worth it to go for? How much work will it take to get the end results? How do you make that decision? traceable data to help you make that decision? Do you have criteria that will help you do the no go, no go decision in house that you use every time? I think, in my opinion, the most difficult sample is when the sample aggregates. So it's very clear that the protein is a, almost a no-go. We do have detergent additives that can help out or can stabilize the protein. But at the end, when the sample is not good and does not form single particle or homogeneous distribution, it's very clear the sample is not. We, we do use very often, uh, the very first thing we do when a sample comes in is negative stain. And we do a really quick negative stain analysis. And that is the first go or no go. Because if the sample is even marginally good, so it has a little bit of aggregation, then single particle, then we'll go ahead. And work. But if it's really largely aggregated, really not suitable, then, then we stop. Okay. Uh, 
that's that's the very first characterization. So that idea of failing fast just based on that alone immediately goes back to the cloud chemistry lab. Yeah. 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 Or at least to a conversation with the cloud telling that it's now working to some people. How do you make the decision that the aggregation is inherent in the sample and not vitrification? Well, that's a simple step, right? Yeah, because yeah. this is, is with negative staining. Okay. So in that case, it's definitely inherent to the sample. Oh, yeah. Negative staining just, sorry. Yeah. Yes, yeah, some aggregation different. could be induced with air water interface. Of course, then there are some, as we said, you can have additives as well as you can use the chameleon for um, assessing the quality of the protein. This would be another step. So now that I hear that you're doing so much negative staining, do you see the need for innovating in automation, negative stain preparation pipeline to really triage samples? We don't know that much. It sounds like a lot, but when you don't well, <laughs> you know, it's a lot. It's a very quick start of the entire day. So I have seen the negative staining program. Mm. They, they do exist. But we, it's, so maybe, a, a, so in single particle, we don't do a lot of negative state because we just use it as a yes, no, that's good. Okay. But if you move into characterization, for example, they do use negative staining a lot because a lot of the samples that they have, it's much faster for them to look at, for the questions that they have, the negative staining is a good answer. And so maybe in that case, it could be useful to do an accelerating because if you make 10 grades of the same sample and different conditions, then it is so short. But for what we do, that's the thing. So if you get past that first negative stain and you move into cryo and you're starting to look at vitrification, what kinds of issues come up there? I'm just wondering, um, do you ever see issues with protein stability, perhaps from the air water interface or something? Wow. <laughs> Yeah, induced by the air-water interface is usually the preferred orientation. Mm -hmm. And of course, then we have the three standard procedures, what we do. One is definitely the tilted connection, which we don't affect the protein itself. Another one is the adding additives, like detergent or stabilizing additives to the protein, so it does prevent the air-water interface. The third one is then usually so these are the three major. And do you see any one of those that benefits more samples than the others? Is there a go-to there? Or? The part of the turgeness that's not um, unique. So we do have to screen different detergents for different proteins. Mm -hmm. For tilted, does not work every time. It depends on the, on the degree of preferred orientation. The chameleon itself does not affect Protein. Adding the additives. So there we can uh, adjust the plunging time or also adjusting the ice thickness. So this has actually shown to be something I have before. Yeah, I think that they all work to a certain extent. <laughs> and it's, sometimes it's worth trying them all. Yeah. And sometimes we get the best result when we put the all together, right? Yep. So we, we do a chameleon run, and we do a detergent run, and then we do a tilted run, and then we combine them all. And we had a case in which chameleon and gold induced the two extreme preferred orientation, but perpendicular to each other, so two different views. Okay. And so combining the chameleon, the gold, and the gold tilted, we were able to really solve the uh, the problem uh, in a way wow. that neither one of the technique by themselves would have used. Use all the tools. Yes. Always. We had right. also a few <laughs> cases where we had the detergent and combine the data with the chameleon yes. together, solve the preferred orientation. So, this is very much the workflow experts, and so, yes, do everything, but you must have a preferred order. So, negative stain obviously is where we started. So. The way you described it, tilting would be the easiest thing to do first. It's already in the microscope, I'm guessing. And then you go for detergent screening, or then on chameleon, or are we starting with chameleon? 
sometimes you can see the preferred orientation already straight away from the micrograph, but sometimes you can't see the preferred orientation straight away from the micrograph. So we don't, when we don't see it from the micrograph, of course, we do a zero degree first. Then we usually, after the analysis, we see the slight orientation, the preferred orientation. Then we, some, it's like orientation dependent, then we go for the, for the third in the second trial. Unless we have already prior knowledge or we can really see it from the micrograph, then we, when we have the prior knowledge, then we actually go straight away already. We have a small set of without additive, and a small set with detergent, and a small set of chameleon. And then we, at the end of the day, we compare. These are all on the microscope at the same time. Yes. Up to, we have sometimes two loads per day, so they're not all the time at the same sure. time. So usually, but we do have a small subset in some extreme cases, not every time, not every project will be having chameleon detergent as well as none. So then we, at the end of the day, we usually uh, choose the best grid. Sometimes, most of the time, determine on the ice thickness and the distribution. And then you collect the first one the data. It's like almost 50 50 between detergent or chameleon, and then you go. So, you spoke a lot about uh, the different tools and the different solutions to the problems. And so, you seem to have a wide range and diversity of things you can try. Are there some tools that you have? in your toolbox that we haven't mentioned yet, perhaps different types of grids, different hole sizes, these types of things that you can use for the more exotic types of problems you have? Yeah, for low or some preferred orientation actually has been also good that we use a smaller hole size, 0 0.6. So the surface tension in the hole is changed. We do get a little bit of thicker ice at 0 0.6, so it enables the protein to rotate. We do have, we use sometimes a 0 0.6 for lower concentration of proteins, so that it has a little bit of a better chance to enter them into the hole. But we, for low concentration, we have other tricks of grids. We have graphene oxide grids, we have continuous carbon grids, we have the um, uh, uh, yeah, grids where we need lower concentration, which helps the high problem protein go into the additional. Um, Oh, it's the film? Well, it's a film. The film, yeah. yeah. The, additional <laughs> film. <laughs> the additional film so that the protein can enter into the wall sitting on top of it. Okay. Yeah, the problem with that is that you can, I mean, they should be larger proteins because little tiny proteins tend to be lost in a graphene oxide. For example, you won't see it. They won't be so larger complexes. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, just out of interest, what's the smallest protein you're happy to do currently with? Well, we're happy to do <laughs> 250. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, there's how far you, how low you can go and of so, what you're confident with saying, yeah, we'll be able to do this. We always say at least 100 kilo doctor or order map, which means that if the protein is 500, but in reality it's made up of 10, Domain, so 50 kilovolt on each is now usable. Yeah. So it has to be a handle or order. That makes life relatively easy. Since so smaller complexes and smaller protein can be solved. I think that we have a record that's like 46 kilovolt on subdomain of a protein that was much larger, but only that portion. Uh, we managed to stabilize it. But it took a lot of time. And do you ever use, uh, that's just me getting interested then, um, we see a lot of papers where people are starting to use nanobodies and things like that to enable them to solve smaller proteins. Have you done any of that at NIS? Is, is, is we have done with, uh, uh, with the fabs, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, that is very much on, on the, in the client field area. They have to decide if they have the nanobodies. It's not that oh, if they have the antibody that we can use. So, um, we could use, we have used it. Uh, Using the, the, the fabs, it could be risky because they do try to induce preferred orientation. <laughs> so, so one problem. 
they are good for small particles exactly, but sometimes they, they really like to sit on the ice, uh, you know, with, in a certain orientation. And yeah. if a particle is very small, they drive the orientation. So, but yeah, we have. And I guess one thing that comes up a lot as well, certainly in publications now increasingly, is flexibility of proteins. Yeah. I mean, lots of these publications show people solving very flexible proteins with multiple classifications. Do you do any of that, or are you really trying to optimize for single conformations? Thank you. Not so much simple. So. We don't really have a choice, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, and what I'm trying to say is that if the, conform the variability, the conformational variability of the protein is what they, they are interested in, because that's the uh, information that they are trying to derive from the experiment, then I personally don't want to stabilize it, because if the information is the variety of forms, then that would be have to work with. I would say, luckily, we didn't have that many of them. We have protein in which it could be a problem because maybe we don't know up front that it's going to be so flexible or so terrible. Mm -hmm. and, and then that is a problem. Yeah, yeah we do have the, the two types of flexibility. The one type is the continuous flexibility. It's, this is very hard to, uh, to overcome. But there are the discrete flexibility where we can see two to three structures usually. When we have a discrete flexibility, we usually collect much, much more data and we can sort them out. But with the continuous flexibility, you can definitely try to collect more data, but it's very high likelihood to fail. So usually we ask, the, it's going back to the biochemistry, they can change the protein to smaller sizes to remove the flexible region or adding additional protein to make it more stable. Right. That's usually the, the solution for flexibility. There are softwares, right, that deal with this continuous flexibility. Yeah. Dragon, uh, even Spyros Parkers as well. And so what, it, it, they work fine for academic purposes, I think. Yeah. And when you're interested in seeing maybe a relative domain motion, most of our clients want to see the ligand, and so you won't, because this will give you a four to six Armstrong resolution of domain sample. Mm -hmm. So if your ligand binds in that domain that moves, that's a completely useless, basically. <laughs> it's interesting from a biological point of view, because maybe you all share the identity, but from the practical request of the client, it's not. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There is also that, but it's only taken into consideration. You have a great variety of solutions to a lot of different problems, but do you have a wish list of things that you might want or things you might want to see developed in the future to solve some of your recurring problems? Your yeah, wish list would be the gold coming in with. <laughs> <laughs> Just, hmm? okay. So perhaps we should, should unwind a little bit because we've talked an edge about chameleon, but what is it that chameleon brings to the party for you when you're looking at increasing? So. Definitely improves the the downstream efficiency, so that the decisions you're making are based on data instead of a random occurrence that day. Yeah. So I do see. You know, when you come to my facility, I always said. You are going to know your biochemistry better than I ever will. And so if I can get you to optimize your sample, it will turn out better than me optimizing your sample. So Chameleon is a tool which helps the sample owner learn about sample dynamics, which then helps them make the right decisions to get the structure without modifying the biochemistry that they're interested in answering the question of. So it's a, it's a bit of a hands-off approach too. You start adding things to your sample and change what's naturally supposed to happen and not answer the same question anymore. So. <laughs> it's easy to go down that path. Yeah. yeah. Just to get it to work, just to get the structure. So yeah. let's start with things that are not modifying the sample first. And then, you know, there's always a, an approach that's throw everything at it to get it to work as well. So when you look at all these different factors, um, 
where do you see the biggest fall off? Is it when you're looking at, at um, negative state at, at that point, or is it during vitrification? If you manage to vitrify something, do you nearly all in a reasonable condition? <laughs> do you nearly always then get get to a structure solution up to that point? I'm just interested what the relative to sit divisions between those variables checkpoints are. Uh, you get to some structure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I think that 90% of the game is to get the sample on the grid. Yeah. Because if the sample is on the grid and the grid is decent, yeah. then we will get something out. You'll learn something. you learn something. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's, that's what we always tell everybody, that if the sample is okay and you get to visualize the grid, then uh, we'll learn something. So once you get past that, negative stain so that you can see that you have some kind of folded thing to study. You know, once you're onto that vitrification stuff, you're fairly confident you'll get somewhere in the end, even if it's a long journey or no. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is once we have done with the vitrification, okay. we are convinced that we might get something again. It's interesting. Yeah. But not always. But most of the time, right? You say? If you vitrify, we can use. So, when, so at that stage of vitrification, you know you've got a, a well-folded protein. What is, do you think key things are that, that for vitrification to fail? Is it is it the flexibility of the key thing? Is it concentration? Is it is it something that the vitrification itself does? So we are. <laughs> it's a little bit of everything, right? So it's uh, the protein. It's the air water interface that plays not nicely with anything and so the protein complexes tend to fall apart in the air water interface. Uh, protein tends to the nature of the air water interface. So, so vitrification is, is really bad. Yeah. Really, really bad. So stability is difficult during vitrification. Yeah, I yeah. think so. That's why novel methods of vitrifying are very important. We need to address that. I often hear people say it's a miracle plunge vitrification never worked at all. Change is good. Yes. Moving much faster than we ever did before. Uh, just getting even small bits of information and intermediary structures are really important to these problems. Yeah. I mean, it's not I, always about the highest resolution structure yeah. every time. Yeah. It's just yeah. that bit of information that's going to move a project forward. Yeah. So. I mean, that's an interesting question in itself. How users define what they're looking for, in yeah. a, you know, what they're expecting to get when they when they come to you. It's. It, <laughs> That's a good question. Is it user defined or is it, do they say I need this? Oh, they, they say they want two angstrom solution. We get it <laughs> do they get that? <laughs> That's different. Um, they know what they need, right? They know the biochemistry and they know their, the essay out of their compounds. So, so we, we need to work with them to get to where they want. They want what they need, otherwise they won't come back. But it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Can provide a solution or some kind of answer. I mean, it can be as simple as the way it is, it will never work, and find an alternative way to characterize your sample, characterize the binding, or uh, can be as that. So it might, the, the end point might not be the 12 source structure. Yeah. It might be just go out. Uh, Go do something else that will be much more useful than spending your time and money with us. That, that's a perfect yeah. fine outcome. Managing expectations is the number one job of anybody that owns, a, owns a workflow for Cryoam. It's mostly because, you know, in academia you see a lot of resources and time sucked away by just endlessly trying to fix things. And a lot of times you just have to say, no, it's time to go back. Yeah, your time. Yeah, it's very cloud and possibly have clients there for them to declassification of negative state are enough to see the binding site of the compound elsewhere of the other body or of the fab. Yeah. So it's good enough. So when we have educated clients, so we don't have to always aim for the two instant resolution. Yeah. And I sometimes wonder whether there's a learning process that is related to a point in crystallography where we got to, and I don't know if I also used to be a crystal, where people stopped blaming, you know, 
giving you any old protein to grow a crystal with and started to look more, much more carefully at biochemistry of what you going to Seems to me sometimes we're still in a little bit of a Wild West time and crime mm-hmm. is just starting to learn that garbage in, garbage out. Absolutely, yeah. So that brings up the top of the throughput, screening across many different samples to see what will resist or doesn't go in that route instead of trying one at a time. Yes. Yeah. I think I think that's a natural stage. I mean, certainly I remember when I first started in crystallography, it was still very much you would crystallize whatever you were given. Yeah. And then there was a definite switch where people said, well, hang on, if what you're giving me is rubbish, I'm never going to be able to we are trying to tell people <laughs> that, that there is a lot, you know, it's, it's the better the sample, the higher the chances of getting the sample. Yeah. And so what, one thing that we are offering now is a protein production consult. We don't do protein, we don't make proteins. But we do offer services that, that anybody can work with us in designing the albumo construct or uh, trying to optimize uh, uh, the protein production procedures are to, if it is a membrane protein, trying to optimize the detergent. And so that for us is better because then we we'll get a sample that we could definitely give us something. And for the client is also better because they, they understand that they are optimizing what they can on their side and then they have a higher chance of paying the clients. So it's the sample at the end There is a lot that we can do because the application makes even the best Samples, but it's not really bad, it's bad, but it's not really bad. No way out. Absolutely. It's awesome. And my console, we can't see anything, but yeah, <laughs> it has to be something. You can see jumps too. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Junk is a highly resolved. Highly resolved junk. Yes. <laughs> 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 Hi, there, <you're> Absolutely. Could be a definition of intrinsic distortive protein. Yeah. <laughs> so, what is basically your kind of time scale of the structure loop? So, I understand that you have 8% that right, or right off the bat, where you have one grid and you have one loop, and you're free. Yeah. But everything else takes a few passes, right? So, how many passes on average, or like, what's your, you know, most passes ever had, and how much time does that basically uh, resolve? In? On average, average. Three passes. Yeah. Because we do learn. Let's say membrane proteins to protein complexes. Of course, the first round will take more passes, but then when they come back with different compounds, of course, then we learn from our first round, so it reduces over time. Yeah, I say that for a first sample, it will take at least three days on equations, more or less, mm-hmm. or screening mm-hmm. in order to optimize the grades. And then uh, one or two days. And as timing goes, it's anywhere between six to eight weeks, depending on microscope availability and how you're trying to track all of this down, right? For an average sample. Since you're seeing so many different samples from so many sources, you must be building an incredible wealth of knowledge from the behaviors of the different samples as a core facility. So you're building a lot of skill and a lot of wisdom, if I might say, about how things behave? That's a tricky question. (laughs) Because, yes, there are some common things that, like protein of a certain family, they are characterized by something. But in my experience, every sample is different, Mm -hmm. no matter what. Even the same protein prepared by two different clients is not the same protein because the prep is different, because this concept is different, different. because the buffer is different, (laughs) whatever. Concentration, any. 
changes. So it's really, it's, yes, I mean, you know, you learn genetic things, like we learned that with PCRs, you need to use a high protein concentration, and you need to put a nice impact on the grade, and that, that applies to every protein. But how you get there with individual proteins, it can be a completely different path. Yes. At least, I think. Right? So you don't go back and look through your data when a new client comes in. No. It's like, have we done anything similar? You gotta start from scratch. Well, there is a little bit of also. Yeah. We, we try and each protein as individual protein. Mm -hmm. so, and yes, then yeah. But we, we think, oh yeah, maybe it worked with last time, but it's not gonna work this time. <laughs> so I don't even bother. It's not practice. Interesting. Yes. <laughs> it is. It's true. Every it's protein is yeah, different. It's like it's amazing. It's not the, so, I mean, that's a bit depressing, right? You have all of this data, but what we're finding out is we still need a really efficient workflow to start from every time. We it's need a workflow that's fully independent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great way to say it. Right, so, that yeah. that will work with no matter what you throw at it, uh, and use the same work. If you start playing with the additives, uh, that that is all sample dependent. Mm -hmm. So, devil's yeah. What biochemistry technique has a workflow that's utterly independent of the protein? I mean, is that not part of the of the area we're all researching? The fact that there are always these variabilities. It gets down to the physics of what's happening, right? Yeah. In this case, yes. You don't understand, you know, cryolim especially, a lot of what's going on in our samples has not been researched by us, it's been researched by other fields, and so we're just learning about the physics of how things behave, specifically in vitrification, but now we have to learn about that in relation to proteins, and so it's, uh, it's the early stages of being experts in our own technique, I think, especially in uh, and it's mostly because we don't have, we didn't have the tools that give us traceable feedback that we can learn from. So now, hopefully with Chameleon, you will see you know, there will be measurable ice thickness, which will work for certain proteins. We don't know why yet, but when we do know why, we will be able to say this protein, maybe it's a bit size or it's type, we'll prefer this thickness of ice to be here. Or it could be plunged to be here, some other. I'm more optimistic. <laughs> At least in Good. broad strokes. Yes. <laughs> no, I think it's, you know, maybe we will learn that if you have a protein that's long and narrow, we'll prefer a thicker ice yeah. than a thin oriented salt, right? Yeah. A protein that is nice and round, maybe a thin ice is better, and that will be true to a uh, viable protein. So that's what I'm saying, it has to be protein independent, there's a knowledge that has to be. Yeah, but this is a major oh. bioinformatics analysis program. <laughs> That's a whole work. Yeah. It's a whole loop. will require many more samples than what we have. And it all points to experts, right? Yes. It's not going to be, uh, you're, you still need this to drive efficiency, get structures. Having the experts, having the tools in the experts' hands as well, is going to really drive this for the rest of the field. And I'm just going to throw a completely left field question in here. With the news this week that AlphaFold have put another 2.1 million structure predictions into Uniprod, how do you feel the field is going to change in the light of AlphaFold accuracy of those predictions? You're talking to a crystallographer. I know. <laughs> no. I think of a whole is a great tool for uh, an initial model. Uh, it, so it will probably accelerate the way when you have a map, it will accelerate going from the map to the structure. Yeah. It will probably help you design a better construct if you know that and if you believe that there are arts of the protein that are, are uh, uh, so there, you don't want to accelerate that. It's going to be a tool. I think you will always need the experimenter and this for anything. You're not, just not going to rely on a model for drive anything. It will help the development of the experimental evidence. 
We won't replace them. That's the question of everybody else. We will not replace them. And now that the structure exists for all these proteins, whether or not it's true or not, it will still lead to great science because now people have another tool, which is structures to look at biochemical pathways and think up new studies. And so, if anything, I think it will push more people towards structural biology and using the techniques of PRIVM, which is a lot of the MR to yeah. more structures better. They, they, yeah. they, they, they will force us to make more hypotheses, yeah. right? And then develop tools to verify the hypothesis. Structural biology, or integrative structural biology, whatever. I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, it doesn't address the, the kinetic pathways or the interaction. Interact. So, I guess it comes into things like, as you mentioned, the methods and things like that, drives towards deeper knowledge of the biology. Yeah. What we all want. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a really interesting talk. Thank you all for coming here today and talking to me. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Pleasure.